and um, looking forward to presenting and discussing with you this afternoon the highly relevant topic of artificial intelligence in education and the omnipresent question of teachers whether it does undermine or support education. So um, my name is Danielle Hau. I'm I've been uh, working as a secondary school teacher in Luxembourg for 16 years and now I'm head of the innovation department and in my free time I'm doing my PhD in uh, psychology on AI in education and I'm joined by my colleagues Claire and Claude. Maybe you want to present yourself briefly? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Daniela, for introduce, uh, introducing uh, our team. I, I'm uh, basically art teacher from Luxembourg since uh, more than 20 years and working in the innovation division at Script uh, now for seven years already and uh, also coordinating right now in the new subject of digital sciences for our students uh, from 13 to 15 years old, so uh, lower secondary education. Yes, my name is Claude Reuter. Um, I was former primary school teacher in also in Luxembourg. I'm also now working at the innovation department at Script. Um, mostly I'm involved in projects about media literacy in primary schools, but also now in secondary schools. So after this short presentation, we will then go into the into the real topic. Um, so we wanted to talk you through like in three steps. Uh, first of all, we want to start off with a definition of what we are actually talking about, because there are so many rumors and so much talking about AI in education, and we're never sure whether everybody's on the same page what what it really is. So this is our first point. Um, in the second step, we will then go for use cases or more practical stuff on ChatGPT and beyond. Um, and so like highlighting some scenarios of learning with, for, about, and given the current discussions, also despite AI. And our last part, we will then focus on the impact on education, so wondering about the benefits and challenges, uh, and discussing with you the role of the teachers and the students in an AI-supported classroom. So this is uh, like the agenda, and my colleague Claire will then start off with the definition. So, um... What, what is AI? Um, I guess uh, lots of us know actually that it is already in our uh, daily routine, but lots of people do not know about it. About it, and uh, uh, we would like to know actually how do you do feel about AI? And um, yes, to question the big topic of uh, the use of AI in education. So maybe we could start an, a little Mentimeter with the next slide. Please feel free to go to menti.com. Uh, you will find the code here on the slide or maybe just uh, scan the QR code you have here. Nice, uh, we are already about 20 people in it and you will find three big questions. Or, uh, yes, actually, um, phrases. Is AI a threat for human mankind? mankind? Is it a threat maybe for educational jobs? And what about us teachers? Will we survive to this? Maybe Claude, yes, you can you could give us a little insight. We I'm having a look how many people we are here, or oh, we couldn't wait a little bit. Thirty-three people for now.
again for the people uh, who are just joining us, go to menti.com and enter the code 4930-9658. Thank you, Claude. One more minute, perhaps. Thank you, Daniela. Daniela, um, Daniela just shared the code in the chat. So interesting, as we see um, for the three questions, um, the, our audience actually is more disagreeing with the topics. Um, let's see how it will e e evolve. And I think uh, we can just get go along with the with the voting and we will uh, continue with the slides. So feel free to to continue and vote, and I think we will come back to it at the end to discuss. So where is AI? AI is, as I said, in our daily lives, and uh, maybe you use face recognition to unlock your phone or remember some fancy filters on Teams, Snapchat, or Snapchat du during COVID times. Uh, I remember I had lots of fun uh, using some animal filters or some glam and beauty filters to get all my tiredness away and be always ready, steady and fancy uh, during meetings. Uh, you certainly use uh, search tools and web browsers to find answer to all your questions. And uh, with this, you use AI uh, to find the, the, the answers uh, you need. Maybe you go further. You take advantage of AI assistance while texting or listening to music. Uh, I myself uh, in my car, when I, I have a, a real nice music on radio, I just uh, take my Shazam out and uh, I'm very happy uh, to to have the the author of the song, and uh, to to find it uh, afterwards. And um, my colleague, um, a colleague of mine, is using really all five uh, minutes uh, Alexa or Siri to start uh, a route, to find a route, or to start a discussion, or to just start music. So you see, I uh, actually, as soon as you use using mobile phones or you are on social media, um, you find a lot of these, um, how do you say? yes, uh, digital ass assistants that are not really visible, but they are omnipresent. Um, text editor editors are also very known, yes, to to, uh, to blow away some last uh, mistakes we have in our text. And uh, yes, even in e-payment, you find all this assistance. We can agree um, that artificial intelligence refers actually to systems that display intelligent behavior, not intelligence, but intelligence behavior by analyzing their environment and taking actions with some degree of autonomy to achieve specific goals. AI-based systems can be purely software basis acting, based acting in the virtual world, for example, voice assistants, image analysis software, search engines, as we spoke about before, speech and face recognition systems. AI can also be embedded in hardware devices, for example, advanced robots, um, yes, autonomous cars, drones, or Internet of Things application.
Yeah, thank you, Claire. So having uh, talked about the basic definitions and uh, making clear what we're actually talking about, so um, uh, systems that de display intelligent behavior, we're now coming more to concrete um, topic of today, like AI in education. And you maybe know that from media literacy. Media literacy is often framed like learning for media, with media, about media. And we took the same approach here because um, AI is still a, a medium. So we decided to, to talk to you through that by applying that um, sort of, um, of logic. OK, so we will start off with a little graph showing what, what we mean by that. So um, AI in education, we frame it normally like learning for AI which means like preparing for life in the AI age. I think Claire has made it quite clear that AI is more and more infiltrating our lives. We are using more and more AI tools. And um, in this respect, we also start to wonder more and more about ethics, moral, GDPR and data concerns. So this is the part learning for AI, really being a prepared citizen to live in an AI supported uh, society. Then the second um, step is learning about AI. So imparting basic knowledge about AI, so how it works, basic technologies and techniques. And the third step is then learning with AI. This is probably the thing you normally think about when you think about or when you hear the term AI in education. So it's using AI in class. Using AI in class is normally done in three levels. So rather it's used to support pupils, so the learning part, or it is used to support teachers, so the teaching part, or it might be used to support administration and systems. And given that the whole discussion is now on ChatGPT and how this might endanger um, education and the role of, of teachers, we added like learning despite AI. Okay. So we're going to start off with the first step, like learning for AI. Um, then we want to concentrate on ethic and morals. Um, the European Commission has launched, um, I think it was in 2020, the um, high level recommendations on trustworthy AI. And you see it here on the, on the left side. And they basically defined like seven principles, like including human agency, transparency, fairness, non-discrimination, so seven basic principles that every AI should obey to. And the Europe Commi uh, European Commission then like retransferred these basic principles to ethical guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence in education. So something which is very close to us. And now what they've really done, um, we can see on the next slide, they basically parted from the seven basic principles and translated them into questions that every teacher, not only informatics teachers and very techy guys or women, but every teacher can can rely to. And to make that, uh, to give a short example, we can then switch to a teacher like uh, thinking about applying. Um, I, I think it was individualized learning to his classroom. Maybe close, you can um, go for the next step. Um, and then he was thinking about, OK, how 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 could that happen? And then he would uh, start thinking about whether there was a possibility to have like um, human oversight uh, in that system or is there the danger of over reliance to AI systems? So this would be the last point, uh, human agency and oversight. Or he might wonder about the transparency. So in how far can we really like understand what is happening in the system? Why are they given the recommendations they give to the students? So this is really um, like um, a good and, and very practical way of approaching ethical considerations when applying AI in classroom. Well, the, <clears throat> the next step will be learning about AI. That means um, understanding the basic principles of AI, having a basic understanding of the AI techniques and technologies. That's also important to understand how does it function, this new technology. So um, we need to be AI literate. That means, uh, what does it mean being literate? It means uh, if you look at the definition of literacy, you learn that it is more than just being able to read, write and speak. Being literate means um, being able to achieve your goals and develop your potential. So the initiative AI for K-12 uh, developed uh, five big ideas about AI. These ideas 
projects can serve as a framework to assist curricula developers on AI concepts. The idea is to teach the uh, the scientific topic, which seems to be very difficult, by focusing on big ideas of fundamental concepts. And um, this idea to teach by fundamental concepts is not new. It goes back to uh, known pedagogy pedagogues like Whitehead or Brunner. As Brunner said, the more fundamental or basic is the idea, the greater will be its breadth or applicability to new problems. So these five big ideas, if we start with the first big idea, it's perception. That means um, it's the process of extracting meaning from sensory signals. Computers must see, hear and, um, and get the world, the environment with other sensors which is very important for them to to get um, to get this data they need. The second idea is the representation and reasoning. That means computers construct representations using data structures and these representations support reasoning algorithms that derive new information from what is already known. The third idea is computers learn from data. Um, many areas of AI have progressed significantly in recent years thanks to algorithmic um, learning, um, just as deep learning is a well-known word. So the fourth idea is natural interaction. Um, agents must be able to converse with in human languages, understand facial recognition, understand facial expressions and emotions, and uh, we need to talk to them in our language, not in cryptical or computer language. And the fifth idea, the last, is the social impact, uh, just about the ethics uh, Daniel already told you. So it's really important to, to have an idea of what is the significance of this new technology for, for our society. So we'll just look at the next slide and we have a, a practical idea about what it means. Um, the, for example, the idea of learning, learning which we all um, have to manage a lot because we are at school. So computers can learn from data. So just an example, uh, when talking about learning in AI, we talk about uh, machine learning and there are several um, aspects of machine learning like supervised learning. This is an example of supervised learning which shows how you can um, get this concept with young young children already. You have here two categories of flowers. You have spring flowers and you have summer flowers. Um, first of all, I want you to look at these two categories and try to find some patterns. Uh, how can you define spring flowers? What are common patterns for spring flowers? What are common patterns for summer flowers? So I just give you some seconds to look at it. Surely you have found some common patterns. Now I give you a new input. We have a new input, a new flower. And now you should decide um, regarding your patterns you found. Um, does this flower belong to spring flowers or to summer flowers? Well, I, I give you the answer. Um, if you look at the summer flowers, all summer flowers have orange petals. So this new flower, it doesn't have orange petals, so it's more spring flower. So this is called supervised learning. That means you have different categories and these categories are labeled by humans. So humans define these categories and um, it's the AI who gets examples of every category and tries to find itself common patterns to distinguish if there are new inputs. Another example will be unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning means that uh, there are no predefined categories. Just the AI system, it gets all the data inputs and it has to find itself categories. So here you see in this example, you can create categories um, depending on the colors, depending on the form of the petals. So it's difficult. You don't know the categories. It's the AI system that will find the, the categories by itself. A uh, common example of our daily life is um, the, if you have a client card in a in a shop, um, it's an AI who, will, who tries to find uh, some categories about uh, what common patterns for the different um, clients. In. 
Well, that was about the five ideas about AI. That means understanding how it works, how does it function, this technology. The so next will be learning with AI. That means um, yes, there are a lot of um, software-based tools uh, for learning with AI, like um, pupil supportive learning. That means um, you have uh, a software for pupils who work with them. We will see it um, lately. So you have teacher supportive AIs, that means um, software that helps the teacher um, in his lessons, and system supporting that's for the administration. So these three topics. Um, learning with AI or ChatGPT, well, we have already used a lot of learning uh, with AI systems in schools uh, where we, did, we weren't aware that it contains AI. So, for example, you have um, in PowerPoint, you can rehearse with a coach. Um, DeepL, perhaps you already used it at school. Um, you have Photobus, Duolingo, or other tools. A lot of tools were already used by teachers, perhaps without knowing that they will contain AI. So, AI is a common tool already in school classes. Yes, and um, as Kurt just presented you, and this is quite important to us, like everybody's now quite overwhelmed by the new possibilities that ChatGPT is offering. And now everybody's very clear that AI is really going to, to be in our classes or is in our classes. But we really have maybe to step, yeah, step back a little and just uh, reconsider that maybe we have been using AI before, but without knowing it. So uh, uh, a very simple example is um, some educational apps that you might have used during your classes, whether it be in mathematics like PhotoMath or MathOver integrated into Teams or Duolingo for schools or Socrative or some other kind of educational app. That was maybe something only digital to us, but we didn't care about AI in, in there or not. It was not a topic. Now it is. And now when we reconsider these educational apps we've been maybe using already for quite a long time, we can say, OK, there's AI into that. Duolingo is using AI to get like individualized learning paths um, for their students. So it is really not that new, but ChatGPT has made it quite obvious. So um, yeah, talking about ChatGPT, everybody's talking about it. So what what is it really? So um, Chat, I think that would be clear. Um, but GPT, what, what is that essentially about? So um, to start off, it's a large language model. It's not um, a logic model. It's not a knowledge model. It's a language model. And then it's generative. So it's generating something. And maybe we can step back and just look at the very beginnings of um, text generations by artificial intelligence. This was done by Markov chains. And they use transition probabilities to just calculate the probability to come from one letter or from a pair of letter to the next one. And this is basically what ChatGPT is also doing. So it's calculating a lot and it generates new sentences based on the data treated by algorithms. So it's generating new data, but only on the basis of existing data. And then we come to also to the P, like pre-trained. Um, there might be some misconceptions about like ChatGPT being linked actually to the internet and to, to everything what is going on now. Having looked a bit more into the detail, we all know that uh, for now it is based on the data like in, provided in 2021 on the internet. So it's pre-trained. It's not training on, on demand, but it's pre-trained. And transformer, this is a specific architecture of neural networks, which allow for very many association links. And this can be seen when you type in some prompt in, into ChatGPT, you never get the very same answer to it. And this is due to the fact that there's so many association links possible in that system. Well, you, you certainly have already noticed that um, there has to be, we have to take care because answers sound right doesn't mean they are actually right. And as I stated before, it's not a logic model, it's not a, not a, a knowledge model, and it wasn't built to do so. So many people, and I guess also many teachers, have been a bit disappointed, but it's not right what ChatGPT is, is providing us. But we have to acknowledge that it's only a language model. 
Yeah. And maybe um, just to, to say that there is not only ChatGPT, but there are also alternatives to that, like Bing AI, which was integrated in the chat, Perplexity AI and others. And here on the side, you just see some Yes, some proof of that non-logical reasoning from time to time of ChatGPT. I know, I'm sure you you know many of these. Yeah, and then we come to the learning despite AI. Um, and there we want to um, point out uh, to the fact that how to handle how it is called already cheat GPT, because everybody's now talking about the cheating um, that might be yeah, fostered by chat GPT and the motivation gap. Why should students ever want to write some essay if chat GPT can do so? So oh, basically we, we are wondering. So there are two reasons why assignments are easy to cheat on. They can be trivially searched for or pupils rarely have to prove their knowledge or work. They just have to end in and then it's done. And these kind of tasks really turns our pupils into human text generators. And maybe we shouldn't wonder too much when they then start using artificial text generators to do these tasks. So, but we, we have options. We, we can have at least two options. And one option would be like change the assignments giving. This could be done very simply. Just before handing an assignment, take a moment and search for, for it on the internet yourself. If the resources allow you to completely or nearly completely answer your questions, you maybe have to work on it uh, to really create like assignments that require pupils to combine information from different sources and, and, and to work on it and not simply repeat it. And the other way is change, change how the assignment is given. So um, maybe pupils don't have, not only have to hand in the, the final product, but also the drafts of their work, their notes. Maybe there's more emphasis on oral presentations and explanations of what has been written. So overall, there's a huge discussion about putting the process before the product to, to handle the problem. Yeah, and um, yeah, what can we do? We, we, we have several options, at least two. The more reactive approach of, of us teachers would be like, OK, that's that's hard. I have to look for a plagiarism checker and there are some being developed at the moment. And we certainly will see like a cat and mouse race on that, like ChatGPT or other uh, generative AI AIs getting better and better. And then the plagiarism detection gets also better and better. So we will see that coming. I'm not afraid of that. So we can wait for that. Or we can have students really like document the information and the research process, as I just said before. Or maybe they really have to label each adopted idea and prove correct sources. Or we can simply say, OK, that doesn't concern me. I have my written exams and tests in my class with no internet and no digital device on it. So I'm pretty sure that ChatGPT in that specific test situation is not an issue. That would be more the reactive approach. And then we don't want to say like this is the bad approach and the other is the good one. It's just maybe a mix of both. Some more proactive approach would be like really um, looking into it, playing around with ChatGPT and, and AI and, and looking for what it can and what it can't. So maybe um, you could use it to correct text in different languages, just as your students do. It can also be beautifully used for brainstorming and it's quite good at creativity techniques. So if you have seven heads or some different aspects of the same um, issue, ChatGPT is quite good in, in providing some, some basic thoughts on that, which then of course need to be re-examined. So you as being a very um, expert in your specific subject, you might notice, but your students might not notice that ChatGPT might be wrong. So it's really like not taking everything for granted, but really questioning together with your students the results that that are um, generated here. Yeah, ChatGPT might be used to detecting and explaining mistakes to so give feedback to students, something we've been struggling a lot with. If you have like 20, 25 students in front of you, giving instant timely feedback is, is so hard to do. And some technological digital stuff might come in handy there. Um, it might be also used for um, inclusion. For instance, like having texts in, in different levels, easy language, more sophisticated, that can be easily done with ChatGPT. Or to help with formatting like uh, tables or stuff like you spend hours with, and that could be really 
like a good option to to save time. Um, I've met quite a lot of teachers who now introduce tools for tools. So um, they say, OK, we're talking about ChatGPT. We're using it in our classrooms. We are discovering it um, student side, teacher side, but we have certain rules to follow and we are very transparent on that. That meant by also a good approach to, to handle the problem. So apparently my slides uh, are not there, but I would like to talk to you about the different data that can data that can be used actually. Uh, oh, thank you <laughs> by uh, AI. And uh, let's just concentrate on images. So the first image, uh, you, you will see me, it's it's a lot easier uh, for data uh, agreement protection uh, and so on. And uh, yes, I had a lot of fun to, to see all the possibilities of uh, giving my face and then getting lots of uh, filters on it. So I can actually very easily create fake images like fake news and uh, the fake can be very deep as AI can also also uh, practice uh, deep learning. So here's some examples uh, from me uh, in form of a cat or with text in front of my of, of my face or you have more advanced uh, filters done by actually contemporary artists like Ines Alpha, for example, very, very interesting interactive filters. Uh, you can embed yourself in the Cleopatra film, for example, so you have it also in video. And I'd like to share the two pictures I've done with my children. The, the on your upper right side, you see uh, my eldest son with me with short hairs and uh, beneath you see my youngest son but with long hair so this was very interesting because the AI actually interpreted my face as a male face because I had my long hair uh, in a ponytail and um, in in and in yeast, I had my hair just letting uh, um, let around, and uh, then AI recognized me as a woman, and that is an important fact. Uh, you see, there there are biases because we all agree about the fact that there are lots of women having short hairs and lots of men having long hairs. And uh, that is basically due to the data set, the quality of the data set AI has um, be, been uh, trained with. And uh, yes, we have to be aware of this and also our pupils. On the next slide, you'll see what is uh, what what is possible. You can have some text and convert it into an image. There are lots of apps. I don't want to do an, an exhaustive list of it, but one is um, AI art and uh, you can see on the on the left uh, picture actually that I just had to give in a prompt educational meeting about AI and I could choose a style because as Claude said before AI recognizes pattern and uh, for sure Van Gogh has a rec recognizable pattern in his work and uh, the results I will show them afterwards you have also the possibility to uh, train AI from image to image and I have here a little screen uh, screenshot sorry for my English screenshot for uh, of me uh, as an astronaut as a manga girl and so on and so on and I don't know if you had the possibility to see my bio pic uh, picture but this is a fake picture it is actually AI um, yes who who interpreted 10 to 20 photos to, to spit out a perfect political uh, 
image of myself. On the last example, uh, you see that actually the, the latest smartphones uh, can have a picture, uh, make a picture, a photograph here, for example, from a cart uh, from Luxembourg, and uh, you have this OCR, optical character uh, recognition, who is enabling reading texts on the images, and you can easily uh, copy and paste it. So now I guess um, you want to see what uh, what is a uh, pedagogical meeting about AI. Here is what the app did for me. And yes, it's impressive because uh, actually I, I choose, I, I made the choice of uh, Van Gogh style. OK, but interesting, the interesting fact is, and we can have a chat about it later, is there uh, that there are only men, white men. And again, here an interesting topic about um, cognitive biases that uh, AI carry, carries on with the wrong data sets quality. So as well as creating images from text, AI is also known for creating speech from text or converting speech to text. Just remember the big idea number four is natural, natural interaction. So speech to text or text to speech applications are getting better all the time. In almost every office application, just one moment. In, um, you can either dictate text or you can have it read aloud. Nowadays, it is also even very easy to write text or speak into a microphone and have it read or allowed in another person's voice. With the right software, it is now very easy to create such deep fakes. AI enabled applications make it possible for everyone to create them. So that's a big problem now. It is very easy to create fake news. So in classroom, you can create deep fakes with your students to make them aware of this danger, to show them how easy it is to create such fakes. Or just imagine a history lesson and use such an application to have a text read by a historical figure person, very important person. It could be very interesting, motivating for people to hear a person talking about the historical situation. So to help students understand this technique about deep fakes with voices, you can record their voice and visualize a, a spectrogram. Just uh, OK, it's here. The spectrogram can visualize a spectrogram to show the different voices. If you compare the different spectrogram of all students, you also will see different patterns in the different voices and that helps to show them how an AI can generate different voices from different persons because every voice has its own, its own patterns in, in his voice. Um, what also can be used is um, you have here a, an example of a, an application, it's Foca Coach. It's a software um, to to improve your oral expressions. Tools such as this tool, um, it's a digital speech coaching tool and it uses artificial intelligence and voice analysis to diagnose your oral expression and to train you to improve your public speaking. But AI systems can also be used for creative tasks and um, audio, with audio. You remember perhaps uh, the project uh, Beethoven X. Um, it was an AI that completed Beethoven's uh, 10th symphony together with composers. Uh, and there are a lot of tools uh, like for image creating tools. There are also a lot of tools uh, for creating music in a particular style as in the style of Beethoven, in the style of Bach or every composer. So in the classroom, this can also be used to discuss and analyze the styles of the different composers and to analyze the structure of musical compositions. Just to show the idea of uh, automatically automatically generating music is not new. If we go back to the 18th century, already Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart had invented a procedure to generate a piece of music just by rolling two dice. So this idea, now it's artificial intelligence which helps us to do this.
OK, and then um, like going through the different media, like having talked about visuals, having talked about audio, I'm coming back um, for the text or so text generation. Uh, and yeah, concretely, I have done two proposals like ChatGPT and co used as a teacher assistant and as a student assistant. So how does it make my personal teacher life um, easier? I might generate creative prompting rights for story ideas uh, to propose to my students. I might also write a terrible first draft that students then can practice editing and giving feedback on. I think they, they really like to do that. Um, and or to generate a certain sort of text in a certain style, like do a poem in Edgar Allan Poe style and then have students analyze that to really see, OK, what does this uh, poem has that it makes it Edgar Allan Poe style? So really working on that or on the student side, um, they might like generate explanations to unknown words and building like a glossary for, for their own uh, records or create sentences with new vocabulary to learn and practice it in, in context. Um, they might also do a brainstorming on a certain topic they had to have to write an essay on before and then complement that brainstorming by ChatGPT and see uh, what, what it proposes to take also in consideration could also be used to be a mentor for style and grammar of writing. And that would be also the, the proposal here with the next slide with the informative writing assessment. Um, so you might use WordTune or maybe you know it, WordTune or DeepL Write. Uh, and I've been talking to some primary school teachers lately, and they are also losing in the in the last grade of primary education. They also using DeepL Write with their students to really like get them a feeling of how to improve their grammar because it's it's something different. If a teacher gives advice and feedbacks, that's brilliant. But as I said, it's always not in time and it takes a lot of time to to go through like 25 different essays. And here it's direct and it's also a machine. So so this varies and the machine like in uh, Claude said in Voca Coach, I can just train my presentation and I can train it like 500 times and the system is always very patient and not not hanging in, but always providing feedback. In the next, uh, in the last step, we come down to the um, impact of what we have presented. So um, we have been talking about benefits and challenges before. Um, we have not so much elaborated on the role of teachers, and we're happy to do so with you um, in the questions and answers. But um, I think, Lud, you're going to like wrap up the challenges that come with AI in class. Yes, one of the key challenges um, of AI in education is the need for training and professional development for teachers and other education and also stakeholders. Many teachers may not be familiar with this AI technology or, or they know don't know how to effectively integrate them into their teaching practices. So to address this challenge, education institute should prioritize professional development opportunities that provide teachers with the skills and knowledge they need. Another challenge of AI in education is the need to integrate AI-based educational tools and technologies into the curriculum in a way that it is meaningful and effective for students and also for teachers. I think the use of AI based educational tools may require a shift also in teaching practices like we did just gave well, some examples here and approaches. For example, the use of AI based tools that provide personalized learning experiences may require a more individualized approach to teaching and learning and perhaps also a more project based approach and focusing more on the processes of learning. The use of AI in education also raises concerns about data protection and privacy. All the ethics um, concerns we already, Daniel already told you. So education institutions need to ensure that they are complying with the uh, GDPR regulations and data protection laws. And last but mostly important, are the teachers' beliefs and their awareness towards AI in education. Some teachers may be resistant to use AI based tools or may not fully understand how these tools can support learning. So to address this challenge, educational institutions should prioritize teacher awareness and education around AI. So these are main challenges about AI in education. 
Yes, and then going for the positive part, like going for the benefits, and um, it's to wrap it up because we have talked about it. So um, AI offers the chance of personalized learning experience. What does that mean? AI algorithms can analyze students' data and can adapt to their learning style, providing feedback recommendations that are tailored to their individual needs and abilities. So this is um, a huge aspect of, of, of benefits, I guess. Um, that goes also with the differentiation and tutoring part. Like many intelligent tutoring systems are going not to replace teachers, I guess, but like being at the side of the student, like I said, timely, uh, providing feedback constantly, giving quick responses, um, giving information uh, on demand. That is something that, that digital tools and AI can, can really help us with. Um, it's also a tool to um, make inclusion easier to, to, um, to be a reality in our classrooms. As I said, like having text in different levels of, um, of difficulty, having text in, in, in easy language having um, adapted uh, possibilities to train like with an AI, you're speaking, you're writing, that that's all means of inclusion. And it's also about um, when we're talking about learning about AI, it's understanding the technology or at least the basics of it. And by that providing or developing a critical perspective on technology. If I don't know nothing about AI and it's really like only a black box and nothing more to me, then it will be very hard to, to get to know or how to really handle that in my class. But if I'm giving it a short effort to, to get into, ah, this is supervised learning, this is unsupervised learning, it doesn't hurt, then I think we're really on a, on a good way to, to provide also our students with um, that kind of knowledge. And after all, like, like we stated uh, at several points of the presentations, in the end, AI is one more tool in the teacher toolbox. So it, it's amazing, we're very wow, impressed, but um, at the end of the day, it's a tool and we should learn how to wisely apply that to our students and to our class. Now, it would be really interesting um, to see after our presentation, what you think about the role of the teachers and students now with this additional tool. So please go again to menti.com um via the qr code or you have the code it was posted over there i'll yes here is it again and uh, we will see what the world the word uh, cloud will show us. So just to be sure, are you on the slide with the question, what about the role of teachers, students? Yeah. We have already 50 two people in it. There are no wrong or right answers. Maya, well, yeah. um, seems like there is a problem on this slide. Just one moment. Let me check the problems here. Yeah, one moment.
I see here in the chat that the problem is that um, the vote is the same as in the beginning. So the three questions we had in the beginning. OK, maybe um, time is running, so feel free just to, to comment in the chat. Thank you. So everybody feeling like um, having an idea or a fear, an anxiety, whatever about the role of teachers and students in, the, in an AI supported classroom is very welcome to, to share their opinions in the, in the chat. Because um, basically we didn't want to. Yeah, there are several ways of, 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 of thinking about it, and we're really keen to, to hear your perspective on that. We have uh, one comment. It says we need to use AI wisely. We cannot avoid it. Yeah, yeah. I have That's I have true. a colleague from the French ministry who has always been talking to his, his um, director to to tell him there is no sense in just prohibiting it, but you can't like avoid a tornado or something coming up to you uh, just by simply saying it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, challenging definitely. And how do you feel like um, there are some papers, some discussions going in the direction that AI might even help teachers to to get gain more time to get more into the human contact with their students again? Do you see that coming up or is that something you you're not so convinced of? Maybe maybe while people are, are typing responses to that, we have one comment. Uh, you showed a lot of apps and pages, and I want to try them immediately. So yeah. I got I some nice resources. Here. Yeah, on, on our organization, mm -hmm. um, um, it is uh, if it's an educational one. Yeah, we're working for the script, which is a really acronym for something very specific, but we're part of the Ministry of Education in Luxembourg. And we're like um, the the department busy in getting a pedagogical and technological innovation into schools. So our target groups are teachers. We have one comment as, as technology continues to evolve, it's crucial that we embrace AI and use it to enhance our education system. AI has the potential to personalize learning, provide real time feedback and help us identify areas where students need extra support. Another good comment. The problem is that it cannot make a difference between fiction and nonfiction, so you have to prove carefully. Yes, mm -hmm. and and with the proof comes also there. I see a comment for the legislation or a proper government plan. Yeah, I think this is something um, really lacking at the moment in in many countries. Um, like we have the ethic, uh, the ethical guidelines, uh, which we briefly uh, presented, and and they're good counterstone to build on. But I really like advice on what to do and what not to do and how to handle it is really like missing. I guess that governments and uh, legislative bodies are quite overwhelmed by by ChatGPT coming in December or November last year. And but I'm sure there will be um, regulations on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, another comment, I think that teachers are not threatened from AI, but students should be very, should be very much aware of all the fakeness that can come with AI. Teachers must be able to show students exactly how it works. Yeah, 
when when preparing the the, the presentation this morning, uh, we also uh, said that um, teacher training is really key, and, and and webinars and conversations like that are really key in the process because everybody is now at the beginning. I don't trust anybody saying that he's an expert in AI in education. He might he might do so, but I'm not convinced of that. I think that uh, we're mm -hmm. all everybody playing around and seriously considering what it does or what it what I can do with it. It's like an expert and then we should really exchange and and this is something really like bottom up now everybody is confronted to it everybody's trying to do his very best um to to handle the situation and um this is what it is all about mm -hmm. maybe a, a the final couple of comments if we show teacher show students that teachers can use ai too it can make them more careful using it as uh, plagiarism is then reduced. Uh, right now we have that kind of problem and it's good to see a solution. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Maybe if it's less uh, forbidden or if students see that AI is being used in a different way in a good context, then they're kind of going to be able to distinguish what's the proper way to use it, what's the improper way to use it. I don't know if you guys have thoughts about that. Yeah. So we we always try that that is our most um, important message like when uh, we're doing presentations uh, nowadays it's like really um let's look into that let's let's build this up together and not i think the worst we could do is just pretend like we were living in the 80s and and and, and just go on with our school system and our teaching and like leaving our students alone with all the technology whether it be ai or something different or fake news mm -hmm. or deep fakes and, and whatever that would be the worst case scenario for, for me personally mm -hmm. okay well we have a couple of minutes left um, I don't know if there are any other questions maybe you guys have for our speakers. Maybe we can wait a minute or so. Actually, uh, the Mentimeter is working now, so feel free okay, if good. you don't want to open the microphone to leave your comment. Thank you. And there I see just one um, more critical comment um, about the increase of selling our data to feed to train the machines, uh, which is quite um, true with the AI in every prompt and every search we're doing and um, we're entering our voice, our texts, our images, then um, we're training the systems, we're selling um, our data without maybe being aware of it. But to me, this is really also a a good point in AI. I've never heard so much talking about ethics and morals and everything. I, I haven't thought about that. And I really was like applying many digital um, educational apps in my classes. And now it's really like more on top of mind. That doesn't help too much, but at least there's really now awareness um, on that uh, very uh, important topic. Okay. All right, I think that we're pretty much coming to the end here. Um, I saw a comment in the chat. Yes, the presentation is going to be available on YouTube, on the E20 Europe YouTube uh, in the next day or so. Uh, so you guys will be able to be will able to see everything again and all of the resources. Um, we have some nice comments in the chat for the speakers. Thank you for sharing your links. Very interesting material. Uh, thank you for the training. I wish this series of training like this could be continued uh, and lots of thank yous. So thank you once again to the speakers for taking the time um, and thank you to our participants also for uh, for listening and participating. Uh, this webinar is part of the eTwinning Spring Campaign. So if you guys haven't looked at the group uh, on the European School Education Platform yet, uh, it's still available, so there are lots of resources on there uh, about the annual theme of 2023, which is innovation and education. Uh, so you'll find lots of readings, resources, uh, creative corner on well-being, innovation, social innovation, pedagogical, pedagogical innovation, um, and lots more. Uh, so please feel free to check out that group. Okay. Um,